Today's scripture reading comes from Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And it came about in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, so the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate, and its gates have been consumed by fire. Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. This is the word of God. So uh, just a quick announcement. Next week, we're going to be having our communion service. And every time we have a communion service, we're going to also do this thing called open worship, which is a shorter sermon and just uh, more kind of going into the heart of God. So I talked about this last time, but worship is to encounter God in his presence through our singing, our listening, and our prayers to receive from the Lord all that he wants to give to us so that we can live an abundant life. So that's basically what worship is. So to properly worship God, we need to encounter God and to receive from him so that, uh, and the way to encounter God is through our praise, our sacrifice, our offerings, uh, you know, listening to the word, uh, praying and things like that, okay? So uh, I encourage you, uh, every time we have a communion service, the reason why we announce it is because one of the definitions of communion is uh, it's a sacrament. And that's where we get the word sacred. So it's basically a sacred time. And anytime it's a sacred time, and I'm gonna talk about this more next week, anytime the church comes together and celebrates this thing called a ritual, uh, it's actually a very powerful time. It's, 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 it's a time where God actually wants to meet us in an even more special and a meaningful way. So uh, to prepare for that, some people would actually fast. They would, they would fast, they would take a day out, and they would fast just to prepare themselves for this very sacred moment. So um, if the Lord is calling you and he's nudging in your heart, I encourage you to fast to prepare for this so that you can receive from God all that he wants to give to you, okay? All right, so um, <clears throat> we're continuing on in our series through the book of Nehemiah. So last week, we started Nehemiah chapter one. Today, we're gonna cover chapter two and we're gonna cover chapter three. Now, as we're studying our way through the book of Nehemiah, I just want us to have kind of like the big picture, the big thematic idea of Nehemiah. So the big theme of Nehemiah is ruin to restoration to revival. So you kind of see this in the storyline, kind of the the narrative of Nehemiah, where uh, you see a city that's in ruin, and through the Spirit of God working through his servant Nehemiah and all the people of Israel, they restore the city, And you would think, okay, hey, we're good. Like, you know, the walls are built, the city's restored, you know, uh, everything's accomplished. But the reason why God did the restoration was actually to bring the revival. And there's this incredible revival that happens where maybe in, you know, the first time in like, I want to say like two, three hundred years, where Israel gets to experience the presence of God like they've never done before and to a point where their lives changed. And that's God's heart for you, right? We're not just studying history. I know some of you guys like history. I love history. But, um, you know, that's God's heart for you. Like, God wants to bring the areas that are in ruin that maybe you've been ignoring or you just don't want to deal with it or you've come to, you come to like, live with it. You know, like, you're just comfortable with it. And God, God's not satisfied. You might be satisfied, but God's not satisfied. So he wants to restore that if you will join him in obedience. And as he restores that, uh, he doesn't just want to restore it, restore that ruin, but he wants to bring revival, right? And uh, my encouragement is as we go through the book of Nehemiah that you would join him for this, right? Uh, join, join God, partner with him, right? And don't just listen, but say, Lord, uh, how are you calling me to be partnering in this wonderful uh, book that we're studying through uh, together as a church, okay? So uh, last Sunday, we talked about how Nehemiah had the supernatural co- compassion. So once again, Nehemiah, he's, he's a man's man. He's, he's not a sensitive guy. He's a, you know, he's a warrior. He's, he's kind of like a really tough guy. And God's spirit touched him where he's literally crying for days. 
And he knows that's a supernatural compassion. And as he got that supernatural compassion, he knew there was his calling. This is what he's supposed to do. This is how he's supposed to serve God. And as he got the supernatural compassion, uh, in chapter two, this supernatural compassion flips to fear. So Nehemiah, the Bible says, is really afraid. So let's kind of go into this. So verse one, it says, and it came about in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why is your face sad though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I know, and then it says, then I was very much afraid. Now I know when you read this with Western lenses, you're kind of like, oh, the king is so compassionate. The king, the king cares so much, but the king is actually very offended. Uh, because you know why, back in these days, there's actually a law in the Persian empire that anytime you're, you're in front of the king, you have to act happy, right? Uh, isn't that a good law? <laughs> Right? So it's a law, and, and, and if you break this law, some kings, they get so offended because most of these kings are egotistical and arrogant, they'll kill you. So Nehemiah, he can't fake it anymore because his heart's breaking, but he has to serve the king, and you know, when you're serving the king, like, king, like, you know, oh my gosh, did you hear this funny joke? Oh my God, you're so funny, king, right? You're so amazing, he can't do it anymore. So he's breaking down and there's little sadness and this egotistical, arrogant king looks at Nehemiah and goes, what is this? This is nothing but sadness of heart. See, context matters. <laughs> like the king is like, Nehemiah, come here. What is this sadness of heart? And it's not like that. It's more like, what is wrong with you? Why are you sad? So fear strikes Nehemiah because Nehemiah probably has seen people die because they were not happy in the king's presence. Right? So, um, yay, we know the Bible. <laughs> That's my greatest joy. Uh, you know my joy is to be a seminary professor? Yeah, like, uh, you know, when I go and teach for like four or five hours, nothing brings me greater joy than that because I don't have to use illustrations or stories. I just literally go verse one, verse two, verse three, verse four, right? Uh, can I do that for you guys? <laughs> so uh, background on King Artaxerxes. Uh, evil, bloody, demonic, egotistical, arrogant king, right? Uh, this guy murdered his brother to become king. He had two brothers, murdered the older brother to become king, younger brother tried to murder him to be king, he murdered his younger brother, okay? Uh, deeply paranoid, untrusting, right? Constant attempts on his life. He trusted no one, probably killed a lot of people. Nehemiah probably knew many cupbearers that Artaxerxes killed. You always have to act happy around this king. It's the law. And this crazy king ruled for 40 years. 40 years, right? And you know what Artaxerxes means? It means gentle and noble spirit. <laughs> right? So not self-aware. Right? So not, you know, we talked about the Johari window. This guy needs a, like, we need the Artaxerxes window because he just does not know who he is. Do you see why Nehemiah is scared to act? So he gets the supernatural compa uh, compassion, right? He knows this is what God wants him to do. The biggest barrier in front of him is Artaxerxes. And he has to talk to Artaxerxes. Hey, can I leave you? Can I go to Jerusalem? Can I rebuild the city? Now, do you see why Nehemiah was so scared? Because God was calling Nehemiah to another calling. This is why Nehemiah prayed so much, right? Are you sure, God? The Bible says he prayed for at least four months, praying and fasting. Are you sure, God? God, can you give me more clarity? Can you give me, you know, more direction? Lord, I know you brought revelation, but Lord, uh, give me interpretation, give me application. Lord, I know you showed me what you need me to do, but I want to do it at your time, and I want to do it in your way. One of the problems of bitter fruit is we hear from God, and then we do it our way. And then we ruin what God wants us to do because we do what God wants in our way rather than his way. Another way we ruin what God wants to do is we hear from God, and rather than doing it in God's timing, we do it in our timing. And what you see Nehemiah is, even as he, wait, uh, he, he receives from the Lord, he's waiting about to, upon the Lord for his direction and also for his guidance. Now, in chapter one, you see Nehemiah's supernatural compassion. Chapter two, 
you see in Nehemiah's boldness. This guy's bold, right? Um, so, you know, verse 3, it says, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates has been consumed by fire? So Nehemiah's like, okay, oh shoot, here it goes. It's going down, right? Uh, like, you know, either I die or I get my request, right? This is the point of no return. So he just lays it out. Okay, all the four months of prayer, the, the, you know, the, the four months of fasting, now's the moment, right? So king, and he just goes, here you go, king, right? I know you don't like, like my face right now. You don't like my demeanor and my attitude, but let me tell you why. And if I die, I die, right? That's kind of Nehemiah's perspective. So he says, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? God, you know, ne- uh, Artaxerxes, the reason why I'm sad is because the city that I love so much where I was born uh, is destroyed. And then... Verse 4, verses 3 to 4 is when the supernatural miracle happens. Somehow, Artaxerxes' heart changes, right? We don't notice that, but this is where I believe the Spirit of God honored Nehemiah's boldness and changed the heart of this evil, bloodthirsty, arrogant, egotistical king. So in verse 4, then the king said to me, what would you request? (laughs) Right? That's a miracle, so Nehemiah's like, oh my gosh, his heart is changing. So he prayed to the God of heaven more. And then he said, and here's his bold request, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah. Let me leave you to the city of my father's tombs so that I may rebuild it. Right? You know how bold this is? Okay, cupbearers, once you become a cupbearer, you only have three options. Okay? Okay. Cupbearer is a very prestigious position. It's a high-ranking position. It's a position of trust. The king actually trusts you, right? Uh, You're close to the king, but the cupbearer is also a very dangerous position because you only have three options as a cupbearer. Number one, you get poisoned. That's it, okay? Because, you know, there's a reason why there's a cupbearer because you taste the wine before you give it to the king to make sure, number two things, okay? Number one, is this wine good? Okay, so, uh, you know, he was a connoisseur. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so is this wine good? If it's good, send it back, bring the good wine. Number two, is this wine poison? So the king would look at the cupbearer, the cupbearer would drink it, and the king would just wait for like five minutes. And if nothing happened to him, he goes, bring me the wine. Right? That's his job. So option one, you get poison. Option two, you displease the king and he kills you. Option three, you are successful, the king likes you, and you don't get poison, so you literally die with the king. You never leave the king. Nehemiah is presenting a fourth option. He's saying, king, I don't want to be cupbearer anymore. In fact, I want to leave you to this untrusting, paranoid, egotistical king and said, let me go back to the city of my fathers. Oh yeah, by that city, the city that rebelled against you, let me rebuild the walls. And the king is like, what? So you can become king? And Nehemiah is like, uh, no. Right? Do you see the boldness? of Nehemiah? Would you ask Artaxerxes to go to Jerusalem if you were Nehemiah, right? Some of us have a hard time even asking our bosses for a day off, right? So what is boldness? What is boldness, right? Uh, So, uh, you know, when Pastor Keith retired, uh, we had a wonderful celebration, and I had the privilege to speak, right? And... uh, (laughs) Let me give a public defense that's recorded. So I've never done this before, so I looked up ChatGPT. And I said, hey, what do you do when you know, a successful founding pastor retires? And ChatGPT says, oh, you know, you got to honor them, say nice things about them, how much you were blessed. And then one of the phrases was like, you got to roast them. <laughs> right? You got to roast them. Like, you know, you can't be sappy, you can't cry, you can't be sad. It's not a funeral. It's a time of honoring and laughter. So you roast them. I was like, really? And I wasn't quite sure because, you know, I'm not going to just look at Google and trust it. So I talked to an unnamed AMI lead pastor. (laughs) That's older than me. That's one of the senior leaders that lives in San Diego. (laughs) I'm not going to say his name. 
And I said to him, I said, hey, is it okay if I, you know, roast PK? And he's like, do it. <laughs> do it. It's, he's like, oh my God, he like brightened up. <laughs> like, do it. Oh my, yes, yes. Like I just invented, like, you know, I solved like this mysterious equation, right? I was like, really? Okay. So I did it. Right? I did it. I might have done it too well, but I did it. <laughs> and then, Pastor Sung comes up afterwards, and then he says, somebody was bold today. <laughs> right? Somebody was bold. And I remember I was sitting there going, what does boldness mean? <laughs> what is boldness? Right? What made that bold? Right? You guys, you guys know what boldness is according to Nehemiah? Uh, if I could give a simple definition, boldness is you are ready to pay the cost. That's boldness. So you obey expecting to pay the cost. You, you guys see that? That's boldness. Not you obey so you'll be blessed, but you obey no matter what the consequence is, because God's word is greater than anything else. So, um, Pastor Sung was wrong. <laughs> I was not ready to pay the car. <laughs> I was not bold. Right? Because that's not what boldness is, right? You know, if I knew I was going to get fired, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Boldness is you are ready. You have resolved in your heart to follow God, to obey God. You're going to pay the cost, whatever that might be, right? And you know why Nehemiah was bold? Because he knew what the potential cost could have been, right? Right? I mean, think about it. For Nehemiah to become a cupbearer, he's kind of like pretty wise. Because, you know, palace intrigue, like he's very, he, he is innocent as a dove, shrewd as a snake, which I think some of you need to be in your workplaces, right? Right? Because some of you guys are too innocent and you get messed up, right? Whoa, why is this happening to me? Because you're too innocent. You need to be more shrewd. But some of you guys are too shrewd and not innocent. That's bad. That's sin. <laughs> you need to repent. <laughs> right? You need to be innocent as a dove and shrewd as a snake, and that's how you succeed. And that's my prayer for some of you. You guys are in workplaces where the kingdom of, these, uh, kingdom of Satan is stronger than the kingdom of God. You know why it's so hard to serve the Lord outside of church? Because the kingdom of Satan is so strong. That's why. Right? You know why it's so hard in your workplaces? Because darkness is greater than light. So does that mean we run away and we uh, uh, you know, run away and not do it? No. You engage. Knowing it's hard. Right? Knowing it's hard. Ready to pay the cost with shrewdness and with innocence. Right? So that through your presence, that work and that career be transformed in Jesus' name. So I pray for you that you guys become leaders so that once you become a leader, there's a new sheriff in town and his name's Jesus. Amen? Right? So you have to fight even outside the church. But you got to be ready to pay the cost. Right? Because it's not going to come easy. That's why they call it a spiritual battle. Right? And I hope all of you, you guys become great leaders in your societies and in your careers, in your companies and in your job. But um, obeying God's not easy, right? Obeying, God's, uh, obeying God always has a cost. You know, uh, I'm so excited to do this. I'm going to quote Pastor Keith now because he's a historical figure to us. <laughs> I'm bold. <laughs> it's not bold. Uh, you know, Pastor Keith said what? Obedience costs on the front end, but disobedience costs on the back end with interest added. 
Amen? Yeah, but either way, it costs. You know what our problem is? Somehow, we've gotten it into our minds that we want a costless, comfortable, convenient life. Like deep down, you believe that. And that's the worldview that you're operating from. And that worldview will not cause you to live the life that God has intended. You know, when we started our church, Church of South Lanchino, when you said yes, many of you paid the cost. Many of you left your friends. You left your comfort. You know, many of you have to drive long distance, right? Somebody told me every time they come to church, they have to drive by Anaheim. <laughs> right? Get behind me, right? <laughs> How tempting is that? Especially on a Friday when you're tired and you just see another hour on your GPS, right? Some of you guys had to sacrifice your children. Your children were not happy coming here. One of my children were not happy coming here. <laughs> yeah, it was really hard for her. Praise God, God redeems and blesses obedience. Right? Some of you became even more lonely here. And many of you are now experiencing more spiritual attack. You know why? Because you moved to the front of the line. You know, back at the old church, we're in the middle. Middle is the safest place to be. <laughs> right? Now we're in the front of the line. I tell you what, I'm receiving more spiritual attack now than I did at Anaheim. So I don't have this guy named Keith Park blocking me. <laughs> right? I, I'm getting more spiritual attack. Why? Because we're, we're, we're in the front of the line now. Right? But... If there's a cost, that means you made the right decision, right? You know, uh, someone was saying recently, I was, I was talking to her in the foyer right before service, and she's like, yeah, like, I'm doing church work four days a week, right? And I was like, good. <laughs> and then I was like, you're living the abundant life. And she was like, I think so. Now, you know, some of you guys could serve the church four days a week and not live the abundant life, right? But I think this person is. You know, here's the thing, though. Our church, we haven't had a hard season yet. I mean, we haven't even had a full season, so. <laughs> some of you guys are like, yeah. <laughs> no, we haven't even had a full season. Our full season comes in October, right? But God's blessed us so far. I remember I was praying for our church and I was thanking the Lord. I was like, wow, there's so many blessings, Lord. So you're doing so many good things. And then uh, I got a song in my head. And you know, you guys might be saying, oh, what wonderful praise song is this? Uh, I got the song from the Lego movie. You know that? <laughs> Everything is awesome, right? <laughs> no, seriously, I, I, <laughs> I was laughing to myself. And then I saw Legos like going like this, you know? And like, everything is awesome, right? And I was like, Lord, I, I laughed to myself and I, I said, Lord, everything is awesome. And then a couple days later, I'm reading through the Psalms and I felt like God was saying, I'm preparing you guys to take you guys through a hard season. I don't want it because maybe some won't make it. But I think God is preparing us to take us through a hard season. Now, why? Like, am I, like, sadistic and I just want us to suffer? No, I don't. But uh, what God is teaching us is the hard season is the road to abundance. Right? There is no other road. Right? Like, God, can I get road number two? There is no road number two. So, you know, uh, I read this and, you know, uh, the psalmist says, for you have tried us, tested us, O God. You have refined us as silver is refined. Uh, refining, you guys all know, right? It's, it's burning, like, like you're, you're being burned. Uh, you brought us into the net. Uh, basically, I'm captured and I'm oppressed and I have no way out. I feel like I'm in prison. 
You laid an oppressive burden upon our loins. You ever feel burdened before? It's, it's not a good feeling. You made men ride over our heads, which is you feel like you're losing. You feel like humbled. We went through fire and through water. Like, who wants something like this? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What normal, sane person wants to walk this road? Well, the psalmist says, yet you brought us out into a place of abundance. And then I say to myself, our church, we're not a church that just is content with telling you you have eternal life. I say, our church is a place where we want you to have abundant life. Amen? How do you get abundant life? Right? How do you get abundant life? You make a decision, God blesses you, and you're like, yay, that's the little kid. You know what abundant life is? You walk the road of hardship. And if you don't quit, you go to a place. God brings you into a place of abundance. Right? So I don't want it, but we need it. And maybe it's next year. Maybe it's, year, maybe it's the year after. Someone prayed and told me we're going to have seven years of abundance and seven years of famine. Right? Uh, I'm going to retire after the first seven years. <laughs> <laughs> right? Looking for my successor now. <laughs> right? Um, but whether it's seven years from now or a year from now, I know it's coming. And when it does come, I'm not going to be like, Lord, Why? Don't you not love us? No, I'm going to be like, oh, this is the road to abundance. And for some of you, you're already on that road. You're already on that road. Like in your marriage, your life, your family, your career, you feel like, like you, you feel one of these descriptions. And you're doubting God and you're wondering, Lord, is the Lord with me? Like, you know, you're doubting and you're saying, why is there so much darkness? Well, brothers and sisters, let me encourage you. It's because the Lord wants to bring you to abundance. This is what the word of God is saying, right? But the problem is some of us, we're rarely bold because we're always calculating the cost in our minds, Right? We're always considering the negative outcome. If I do this, what's going to happen? If I do this, what's going to happen? And you're calculating nature. It kills boldness, which kills restoration, which kills revival. Right? God does not honor a calculating, expedient, opportunistic person. God does not honor that person. Because that person, obedience is not the number one thing in their hearts, but it's what do I get out of it? How much am I going to be impacted? Right? And that's what faith is, brothers and sisters. Faith is not just knowledge. Oh, I, I know stuff. Faith is not even agreement. But the completion of faith, the reality of faith, the reward of faith is knowledge plus agreement and obedience that pays the cost of boldness. You know why God honored Nehemiah so much? He was willing to die to accomplish the calling of the Lord. Nehemiah calculated, if I do this, this is going to happen. Doesn't matter. I'm still going to do it. Because right? God is calling me. And God's calling is greater, is greater than my comfort. Right? So, you know, brothers and sisters, once in a while, it's okay to sit there and ask yourself, how real is my faith? How alive is my faith? How complete is my faith? I'm not saying you don't have faith. You do. But how real is it? How complete is it? How alive is it? Right? So why should we do this? Right? Why should I care about the reality of my faith, the completion of my faith? Why should I care that I, I want to be bold in my faith? Well, because God rewards those who pay the cost of faith. All throughout Scripture, you see it constantly. God rewards those who pay the cost of faith. You can never outgive God. But here in the book of Nehemiah, you see that boldness opens doors that never existed before. Boldness opens doors that there was never a possibility. Boldness goes beyond Nehemiah's imagination on the type of life that he could have lived, right? And without boldness, it would have never opened doors unless Nehemiah was bold. Nehemiah never dreamed of going to Jerusalem. Remember, he's, he's cupbearer. He's like, this is it. This is it for me, right? I either get poisoned King kills me or I die with the king. This is it. 
And then as Nehemiah boldly obeyed the Lord, a mysterious, sovereign, fourth option that he never thought about opened for him, and he was able to walk through that door and experience God in ways that he never thought he would ever experience God. Right? That's what boldness does. That's what courage does. Like in marriage, when you're bold and courageous and rather than living in tension, say, you know what? We really need to fix this. Oh, anticipated negative outcome. Oh, I'm calculating. I always know how that person's gonna respond if I did this. But let's say as God is calling you, you humble yourself and you do this boldness, you're thinking, okay, it's either gonna be option one, two, three, I don't like any of those options. A mysterious, sovereign, good, fourth option can come to those who don't trust in themselves, but trust God with all their hearts to create a path that they would have never existed, never known, unless they obey God with all their hearts, amen? Right? This is the way you're supposed to think about the Christian life. Because I know in your mind, you're like, Okay, you know, I'm, I'm at a certain age. I figured life out. Uh, this is the road for me for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And what God is saying is, no, 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 no. You don't even know what's going to happen five years from now. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. Okay, five years ago, did you think the Church of South Lanchino was going to be in existence? Right? Did you think you would be sitting here today? Did you think, like, you know, you're going to do, be doing what you're doing? Right? Did you know I came to the Church of South Lanch, uh, Church of Southland five years ago? Right? If someone told me five years ago that this would happen, I would be like, you are crazy. But there were, by the grace of God, I practiced certain type of bold obedience, and God opened the door that I never thought existed. Right? Broaden your imagination. Your bold, courageous faith opens new doors of opportunity that were never there before. Right? So that's chapter two. Now, uh, at the end of chapter two, Nehemiah, he asked the king for many resources. So once again, he's really bold, right? Uh, he asked for letters of passage, which, um, you know, uh, the reason why is to go from Susa to Jerusalem, it takes three months. It's about 900 miles. And uh, Nehemiah asked for wood, but not just wood, but the king's personal wood from the king's personal forest, right? <laughs> you know, Nehemiah, this guy's a really interesting guy. And then uh, he, he has an army. So he comes in with like this like powerful army. And then Nehemiah tours the broken walls, looking for more confirmation. And then he gathers God's people and encourages them to build a wall. So uh, he says this, then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, he says to all the people in Jerusalem, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God has been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. Right? And then we get to chapter three. And in chapter three, we see a long list of names. Okay, so if, you ever read, if you've ever read through the book of Nehemiah, all of chapter three is just a bunch of names. Right? So, um, you know, uh, I wrote down all the names. Okay, these are all the names in chapter three. Okay, so uh, there's 10 gates. So they have to fix 10 gates uh, with all the walls in between these gates. Okay, and there's uh, 41 groups of people working on 42 different sections of the, uh, the city. Okay, and these are the people who worked on building the walls of the city. Okay, so uh, all these names, right? Uh, you know, I, 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 I had a random thought. I was like, I'm going to make the scripture readers read the entire chapter three. Right? And uh, I was thinking to myself, I think Jean could actually do it. <laughs> yeah, like I'm very impressed by how she reads. She actually emailed me. She goes, did you want to translate it this way or this way? <laughs> no one has ever emailed me. No scripture reader has ever asked me that question before. In fact, I didn't even know how to translate it. <laughs> I was like, whatever way you want, <laughs> right? And she translated it the way that I didn't translate it, right? So, you know, uh, it's crazy, right? So uh, let's, let's, let's read some of these names, okay? So not all of it, but maybe we'll try to get to like, you know, like little less than half, okay? So uh, let's read it together, okay? So, okay, because I know we don't do it, right? Okay, ready? One, two, three. Eliashib, 
men of Jericho, Zakur, sons of Hasena, Meramoth, Meshulam, Zadok, Tekoites, Joida, Meshulam, Melatiah, Jadon, men of Gideon and Mizpah, Uziel, Hananiah, Rephiah, Jedidiah, Hattush. Okay, we'll stop there. Right? Um, you ever ask yourself, as you're doing your quiet time and you land on Nehemiah chapter 3, why am I reading these names? How is this in the Bible? How is this edifying to me? Right? You know, you know, the, you know they say the word of God, all of the word of God is edifying? Like, all of the word of God is edifying, including chapter 3, just a bunch of names, right? Uh, I especially like this guy, Baruch, right? So Baruch, it says, and him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the doorway of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. So Baruch, he didn't just do his part, but he did the other part, and he zealously repaid, uh, repaired it, right? Uh, the only character in this entire list who built the wall with uh, 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 zealousness, right? Passion, okay? Uh, you know what the saddest part of chapter 3 is? Um, is verse 5. It says, moreover, next to him, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not support the work of their masters. So there's people who didn't build the wall. They're like, no, I'm not going to do it, right? I'm not going to do it. Uh, but my favorite is uh, Shalom. You guys see Shalom there? Shalom and what? His daughters, His daughters. yes. <laughs> I'm going to give this verse to my kids. <laughs> right? He goes, look, Shalom and his daughters built the kingdom of God. You are my daughters. We're going to build the kingdom of God together, right? It's like only Shalom and his daughters built the kingdom of God. No other daughters are mentioned in this Bible, right? So um, how is this edifying to us? Right? You, you guys ever read Nehemiah chapter 3 and you walk away going, man, I was so blessed. Right? Dude, that was awesome. Well, uh, brothers and sisters, have you ever been on a list that you are proud of? Have you ever, like in your life, have you ever been on a list that you were proud of? Right? I know we've been on some list that we're not, we're not proud of. But have you been on a list that you were proud of? You know, uh, I went to... Uh, Biola University for seminary, Talbot Theological Seminary, and um, uh, I don't know why, but I, I wanted to um, uh, I wanted to speak at the Calvary Chapel. So um, you know, at Talbot, uh, that's where everybody gathers for uh, like chapel, and uh, I just wanted to. I like I, I remember I was like, oh, I want to speak here one day. So the only way you could speak is. Uh, in your preaching class, the professor picks one student to preach there. So I was like, oh, I really want to speak. And I tried my best, and I didn't get chosen, right? And, uh, you know, I was like, okay, I mean, makes sense. Like, I, like, I, I knew I wasn't going to get chosen, you know? And then I was like, ah, oh, that's cool, but I, I wanted to speak there. Fifteen years later, almost 20 years later, I got invited to speak there, Right? Uh, not give a sermon, give a seminar. So I, I had a really small part. And they had this big conference, and I got to be part of this conference. And my name was on a list. And I'm going to be honest, I was actually pretty happy. Right? Uh, uh, here's the flyer. <laughs> so uh, headlining the list is a guy named Matt Chandler. You guys know Matt Chandler, right? like this famous preacher. And then right next to him is a big dude named Greg Laurie. You guys know Greg Laurie, right? And then right below is another big dude named Ed Stetzer. So these are all the big name people. You guys see my name? You guys see it? <laughs> you guys are like... Right? It's like on the bottom... Bottom middle. Yeah, yeah my name's on there. My, my name, <laughs> yeah. My name's on there with Matt Chandler. My name's on there with Greg Laurie, right? My name's on there with Ed Stetzer. I mean, they have no clue who I am because no one could read my name. But it's on there. And I remember when I saw this flyer, I was like, wow. And I, 
I felt happy. I felt blessed, right? And can you imagine, right? And this, 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 this nothing. Can you imagine Meshulam, the Tekoites, right? Can you imagine Baruch? By the way, I think they're all in heaven right now. Can you imagine? They're like, I'm in the Bible. <laughs> My name is in the Bible. And somewhere in the world, a pastor is talking about me. <laughs> How would you feel if your name was in the Bible? These people on this list, people are unknown to us, but known by God. People we don't care about, care for by God. People we don't want to honor, because we never read this part, honored by God. Why? All because they paid the cost and obeyed. God changed their destiny. What you think your life can be is nothing compared to the life that God wants to give to you. Chapter 3 teaches us that normal, ordinary people doing normal, ordinary things can find their name in God's book. Brothers and sisters, do you know there's another book that God is writing? That once we get to heaven, he's going to open and he's going to read it. Probably an angel is going to read it. Wouldn't you want your name in that book? Well, it's for those who do God's kingdom work. Now, kingdom work, we learn here in chapter 3, doesn't have to be glamorous. These people were digging holes, moving rocks, building walls, installing gates, throwing away trash, making cement, not glamorous at all. But many times when we do that ordinary, mundane, non-glamorous work for Jesus, then we get to be part of God's kingdom story. Amen? Right? So when you go to work for Jesus, when you go to school for Jesus, when you raise your kids for Jesus, when you serve your parents for Jesus, when you serve at church for Jesus, everything you do for Jesus is being remembered by God and being recorded in the book of life. Right? So I was thinking to myself, right? if I could take a quick peek into God's book, this book of life that he's writing, right? that, that, that's going to be read one day, declaring all the things that he did through his people who humbled themselves and joined with God in his mission, right, to, to do his work all around the world. Like, what would this list look like, right? What would this list look like? And then I decided to create my own list, right? Here's my list, right? There's an Andrew Chu there. Which one, Right? There's a Jay Chang. There's a Liz Gamon. Wesley Kwan. David King. There's an Agnes. Right? There's a Hannah. There's an Un. There's an Angela. There's a Steve. There's a Peace. There's Lynn. There's Paul. Some of you guys are like, read my name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after first service, someone said, you didn't read my name. <laughs> You know, you know who these people are? They serve our parking, and they serve our children's ministry. I bet their names are being written in the book of life. Right? And one day, when that name is read, can you imagine how special they would feel? Right? You know, um, I'm going to highlight a Baruch here. There's a Baruch here, right? The zealous one, right? I'm not going to say the name, but there's a Baruch. This person, she serves in parking, and she makes her kids wait. And she tells her kids, mom has to serve Jesus. So her kids wait, right? While mom is serving God. That's a Baruch. Some of you guys 
the perceptive ones be like, oh, there's only one woman on this list. <laughs> Not going to say the name. But that's a Baruch. Right? When we are faithful in the ordinary, guess what? God prepares. Ordinary is the road that we walk down to experience the extraordinary. If you want the extraordinary days, you can't skip the ordinary days. Or as we heard before, the hard days. So um, I want to inspire you today. Do you want your name to be in God's book? Do you want to be remembered by God? You know, everywhere Nehemiah goes, he looks up to heaven and he goes, remember me, Lord. Remember me. And I bet God said to him, I remember you. Then be bold. Pay the cost. Be faithful in the ordinary things of life. Everything you do, do it for Jesus. Everything you do, do it for Jesus. And wait with hope that as you are faithful in the ordinary, that God, by his grace, will bring the extraordinary. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.